Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, these sessions are all going to be recorded. <clears throat> so if you can't make any of them, um, no worries, they'll be available afterwards. But for today's discussion, uh, we're really excited to have all of you here. Um, we've got Paula Shannon with us, and she has a fantastic career to speak to for us. Um, but what we're hoping is that today's discussion, Paula and I both have our coffee, um, and we're hoping that it can be a bit more of a casual conversation uh, and not so much of a pre or Paula has tea, but uh, we're hoping that it can be a, a bit more of a discussion and not so much of a presentation. So for anyone in the session, you there's a functionality in the top right corner that says share audio and video or request to share. Um, and what we'd love is as we have this conversation, we'll start out with a few questions from me to Paula um, to, to sort of open the conversation up, but then we'd really like it to be more of a discussion. And so we have some questions for the crowd and uh, we're really interested to hear about how everyone is doing and, and what sort of experiences you all have had. So with that, uh, I will go ahead and kick it off. Um, Paula, thank you so much. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's really great to have you oh, here as, as our, our first sort of base of the conference today. Um, I very much am looking forward to hearing more about your extensive career and some of the experiences that you've gained along the way. Um, you know, we can talk about historically and then also sort of modern day and, and what COVID uh, and, and the, the current global pandemic has done <clears throat> um, for, for uh, you know, women around the world. Um, but, you know, as far as your career goes, you've had a stint in a very large stint in the localization industry. So first you were at Berlitz as a regional manager. Um, then you were a CSO and a CMO at Alpnet, which ultimately was acquired by SDL. Uh, and then at Lionbridge for almost 20 years, you were the chief sales officer. So you've definitely um, you know, made your rounds in the localization industry. And uh, we're excited to pick your brain on that today. So you, you also started your own sales and leadership consultancy. Um, and then very luckily for us, decided to bring your talents to global. So um, what I would love to do, that that's <laughs> a lot to cover. I'd love to start from the beginning and just a little bit more about how it all began, and then maybe we can move to some of, of more current discussions. That sounds great. And I'm thrilled to be here with everyone. You know, it's an experiment for us as well, for everyone who's joining us, and I'm, I'm loving it because I see the numbers are climbing up. But as Allison said, I mean, I'm happy to answer questions, but I also have a, a goal. I can't wait to find out how everyone's doing and where everyone is and what's going on, you know, kind of, I think that um, collectively we have a more interesting story than I think it, my story alone. So uh, I look forward to getting to that part of it too, Alex. Great, great. Uh, and I hope everyone out there has some sort of beverage, whether it's coffee or tea, um, or potentially for some of <laughs> yeah, for, for some of them. That's it. I said I cheated, but I don't want people thinking this ginormous mug yeah. is coffee because they would be worried <laughs> about my health. But no, I've got my, I've yeah. got my morning tea, but we're Great. ready to go. It Great. Sounds and good. For, for some people in the Eurozone, maybe more of happy hour time, but that works too. So, um, okay. So, so to get started, I'd love to hear a bit about your background. So just thinking about, um, you know, how you got involved in the first place. I'd love to hear about where you're from and um, also you know, how you developed your passion for languages and decided to ultimately make it a, a career. Well, th um, thanks, Allison. And I think um, people who know me you know, through the industry or with whom I've worked, you know, think of me typically being based in Canada, which I am. I'm a Canadian citizen, live in Montreal. I've been here, gosh, almost 36 years. But I actually am originally from the States. I grew up outside of Boston in a tiny little town in between Boston and Cape Cod, right on the water, almost like a postcard. Um, and then I was very fortunate because we had uh, French education started in grade two in our public school system back wow. in those days. So we had an excellent um, in the system. Yeah, it's quite something. And then I was lucky enough to be chosen to receive a scholarship with AFS, an organization that I cannot say enough about. And it's, it's really interesting because through the years, I've found so many people in the localization industry connected to AFS. They had done exchange years, you know, in or out or to other countries, and it's just a, a tremendous uh, network of people. And so I was lucky enough to go to Belgium, where I did a full year immersion 
thrilled, of course, with my French that I would be in Belgium and then landing and realizing, oh, my first kind of globalization crisis. You know, I'm not actually in the French speaking portion of Belgium. I've got to now learn Dutch or as, as the, the local um, language is Flemish. But in school, you learn Dutch. You learn what's called the uh, Algemeen Beschaf Nederlands, like proper, proper spoken Dutch. And it was after that, you know, where you're, you're in a situation you don't understand literally a word that's that's happening around you. And lo and behold, by October, after the school year starts, I was functioning, you know, taking classes, writing exams and doing all the rest and passed all my standard Belgian leaving exams in the spring, which was quite quite hard, actually, quite painful. But uh, that's what put me on to languages. So prior to that, I was actually enrolled to be a fine arts major. And when I returned uh, to university, I changed my major uh, overnight um, and made Russian uh, my major with Spanish and German a minor and, my, my, and, and linguistics. My logic being that Russian was so hard, I would be really humiliated to give up and quit. Uh, but it it was a four year struggle, I will I will admit that. So yeah, that's what started. And then after I graduated university, I went to McGill in Montreal and I graduated and um, moved back to the States to work and um, wound up kind of forcing my way into Berlitz in a kind of funny story that that's how I got started in the language great, industry. Great, um, Well, I, you know, it, it love to sort of see that you were able to take that passion and, and turn it into a career. Um, you obviously have had a very extensive career um, starting at Berlitz and, and then moving up through the ranks to, to public facing companies. Um, and what I would be interested to hear for those of us who are on the line, who maybe are a little bit earlier in our career and are starting, um, you know, that is a, a role that comes with a lot of responsibility. So thinking about this role of being an executive at a public company, uh, there's a substantial amount of influence and responsibility that you bear. And um, I, I would imagine that along with that, there come some difficult decisions that you are forced to make along the way. So I'd be really interested to hear, um, you know, thinking back through your career, are, are there a few decisions that come to top of mind when you think about, oh, that was a really tough time. And I think that was sort of a pivotal moment Um, yeah, that's a that's a good one and gets right to the heart, you know, of of leadership and leadership in business. And um, without hesitation, the hardest decisions are the ones around people. There's no question. I mean, at the end of the day, we're looking at you know P and Ls. We're looking at balance sheets. We're looking at expectations of our stakeholders, whether they're public company shareholders or private company founders and uh, investors. Uh, there is always someone who has an expectation of the way that business will perform. But at the heart of everything, there are people and we are a services industry, powerfully led by technology. Um, but at the core, starting with our translators and linguists, uh, it's a very kind of human um, scale industry. And so the hardest decisions I've ever made for sure um, were during the time when I had taken on a role of general manager. So not sales, I had been running all of the sales for the global Lionbridge um, company, but my partner in crime, Henry Brookmata, one of my closest colleagues and uh, to this day, a dear, dear friend, we were put two in a box as it is, you know, to be co-general managers of what was then about a $300 million business, about 2,700, almost 2,800 employees around the globe. I think we were put two in a box to actually <laughs> annihilate each other. And it was to the chagrin of, of upper upper management that we not only did really well, but we thrived and, and really we did. And the reason I'm giving this context is that we took this role on at the end of 2008. And who knew that in January of 2009, the tech crunch, you know, the recession would happen. And honestly, we lost uh, uh, vis visibility. So our forecast declined 32%, 32% of wow. our entire revenue wow. evaporated with inside of about 10 to 12 days. And I'm not exaggerating because many, many people in the industry, whether they were on the client side or the supply side saw the very same thing happen. So, so what did that mean? It, it meant that we launched into 18 months of difficult decisions 
where people's careers and lives were at stake. Offices were being shut down. Um, decisions were being made about where to invest, where to pull back. And I, I really feel that it, it doesn't matter the scale of the decision that you're making. So these were big um, numbers, of course, that we're talking about. It comes down to that moment one-on-one -on -one where someone is, is, is learning for the first time um, that their career is path has changed, that they no longer have a job or that something is going to happen. That never gets easier. And it really is always the toughest thing wow. that you have to do. Wow. And I, I mean, it sounds like you were fortunate to have somewhat of a, of a partner in that. And I'm sure you were able to work together on that. But it still sounds like it certainly was a, a difficult time. And I would imagine there are several parallels to crisis that a, you know a bunch of companies have gone through just now um, in the current day and age with pandemic that's on um, you know, similar very consolidated timelines where they had to make very decisions that ultimately probably did impact a lot of people um not always in a, a good way um wow okay so um i guess sort of in the, a similar vein um thinking about you know being in in that that role where you're owning a lot of responsibility and it's also very public facing um I guess I, you know, right before this conversation, you told me this is no hold, no, 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 you know, questions barred session. Um, <laughs> does is there anything that happens behind the scenes at a public facing company that, uh, from a leadership perspective, you really aren't allowed to talk about, even though you would essentially love to, but it, it's just not public information yet. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, um, I have. A fiduciary responsibility that survives, you know, my employment period um, at Lionbridge on on paper contractually. But even if I didn't, I mean, there just are certain things that are wrong and inappropriate to discuss. In the case of a public company, it's quite black and white. I mean, there are things that at the time, if they are not publicly disclosed, uh, you may not discuss them, and so that creates a, a certain level of strain. Um, you know, it's. I think not that different from a small startup where you have an entrepreneur founder, you know, who's very transparent and open with employees. And then there reaches a point in time, maybe as the company grows, where information is marshaled a bit. And, and that's difficult, right? That's difficult for the, for the founder. And at the other end of the spectrum on the public company side, I think the times that were, I found the most stressful were when we were working as a small group internally at the leadership team, so four or five of us um, with big issues, such as at the at the end of my time with Lionbridge, as we were navigating the uh, purchase of Lionbridge by private equity, and none of that, none of it may be shared with anyone beyond the group sure. that's been named, you know, as um, as disclosable. So that means that your closest colleagues, your direct reports, and many of your partners in the business perceive probably that you're not putting in 100% on the day-to-day -day stuff, right? Because they have needs and they have a pace of business, as we know in localization, right? It never stops. And that yeah. I found very difficult because there was no way to say, hey, guys, you know, I see what you're doing. Yeah. I know how much is going on. Um, you know, I, I actually did put in 18 hours yesterday, but you only saw yeah. seven of them or something like that. So it's a bit... Centric. I mean, it's a bit maybe apologetic for uh, on a personal level, but I did find that tough because I like to lead more in an inclusive way where you share with everyone what the challenge is, you know, you lay out kind of the options that we have. Um, I learned it took me a long time to um, be less extroverted and less um, mm. front and center, you know, in those mm -hmm. kinds of team discussions to encourage to have the current, you know, to have the floor and to really take the time to listen to their incredibly valuable inputs. Um, but over the years and with some outside coaching and training, I would like to think that I got a bit better at that. And so it's hard. So that's a, that's an in conflict then, you know, with a situation where you may right, not share right. information. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Great. Okay. Well, so I, I have one last question for you, and then I'd love to sort of bring people into the discussion. But um, thinking about the localization industry, you know, <laughs> we, we said technically this conversation would be about, about women in localization. Um, thinking about all those experiences that you've just spoken to. So, uh, you know, the responsibility and, and the different leadership roles that you held and 
also your path to those roles. So um, thinking through all of the different steps that you took to get there and comparing the localization industry to other industries. How do you think that um, your experience as a woman in, in this industry was shaped? Like, it, how do you think it compares? Um, that's a, I mean, that's such a good question and hopefully will be something that we can also chat about with the participants. Um, I, a couple of initial thoughts. I mean, many industries um, have very formal um, qualifications or accreditation, you know, to proceed. And I'm thinking more in the financial services industry or where you need to have a law or legal degree. You know, these things become uh, proving grounds where you can get past kind of the first stage and then you, you have the uh, certification or the accreditation of a second stage. And so as a woman, those can be very attractive because um, you're instantly vaulted to a level of, of equality, you know, with your with your male counterparts by dint of your degree or your qualifications. Localization doesn't really have that, right? I mean, it's it's more organic um, experience in some regards was the the qualification. But I did get really really lucky in my career because at a moment in time where I was considering, um, well, I had been accepted to go to um, grad school for my MBA, and I was accepted at INSEAD in Europe. And, you know, bef before I congratulate myself too much, it took me two tries. Like I, I did, I was not stellar on my first try, but I did get in and I was really happy scrambling to kind of pull the funding together. And at the time I had the opportunity um, finalized to join Berlitz. And in those days, this was 1986, um, Berlitz offered a very um, defined management trainee program, which ironically, if you did your MBA back then, you would actually hope to graduate and get into one of these corporate management trainee programs. Um, boringly, you know, like at a big brand, Build a case like to a certain extent, I would say. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it was like, and, and, you know, if we unpack it though, why is that? Well, it was because those jobs would give you unbelievable visibility into, into all aspects of the business, right? And um, I looked at the Berlitz program and I thought, I, what have I got to lose? Like, this is my passion, with, which is language. I had forced my way into Berlitz by writing to a vice president and kind of saying, I don't get it. Like, why aren't you hiring me? You know, and so after that, when they offered me the job, I think I was, yeah, I was yeah. duty bound to take it. But they did a management trainee program. And I cannot say enough about the program itself, about mm -hmm. the female leadership, actually, that I had at the time. My boss then, Anita Komlos, Anita Baumgarten, one of the most extraordinary women I've ever worked for. And I got to go through finance, operations. This was Berlitz in the mid 80s, which was a powerhouse of language instruction, publishing, yep. right? All the books and the cassettes. And translation was actually mm. quite small for them at the time. So you would be running a school, a, an office, a district, a region, and you went through all of the training of the different kind of functional areas of a company. And my entire career, that training, that ability to manage at a PL level just stood me in great stead. I did regret later, as I was working in a public company environment, the lack of um, true financial um, education that you might have received, you know, with an mm -hmm. MBA with a finance concentration. And that's something I worked very hard at. I, I did outside courses. I did executive education to really get the confidence to operate in the boardroom. But I think that in localization, you if you have come in with more general background, you need to backfill your skill set. And I've always said, Allison, that if you don't understand how your company makes money, or you don't understand how your company is measured, whether it's measured on growth, whether it's measured on EBITDA, you know, whether it's measured on cash flow, uh, then you cannot be aligned as a leader in delivering the results that that your managers, your leaders, or your stakeholders expect. So that's one of the most important things. So if you have any embarrassment or that you know you don't feel that you're as strong on the finance side. It's easy to get, you know, go out and do a course of finance for non-financial managers and just make sure that you know your way around a P&L and a balance sheet. Um, and, and you'll see that from there, it's not sure, too hard to sure. get the expertise you need. Um, great. Thank you. That, that's great. And I, I guess one very last question before I'd love to start a group discussion. Um, you also mentioned some mentors along the way. And do you have any advice for those of us 
you know, earlier on in our careers thinking through how we go about seeking mentorship or um, if there are certain attributes of a strong mentor that you think we should be aware of. Oh, you know, this is where Alice and I, I wish on some levels I could do everything over again because it's exciting. It's exciting to be working in the environment that um, women are in today, certainly younger women, because I think the whole notion of mentoring didn't exist, right? It happened almost by accident. Um, it happened because you were lucky enough to find someone that would take an interest. So let's think about at the core of it then, what does that mean? I think in order to have a successful mentoring relationship, you have to put yourself at risk. You have to kind of expose the fact that you need help or that you could use some coaching. And, and that's hard because we're trained nowadays to, to project an air of competence, you know, and, and that we're on top of things and that we're not flawed, you know, in our, our career. So the first thing is, I think, to be mentored, you have to be open to it. Um, I, I have myself been approached formally by, by women who are seeking uh, mentorships. Um, I've been asked by the board of other companies to mentor an individual or a person. And so that obviously that's quite easy. But I think that the most um, profound moments I had was speaking with someone who I, I wouldn't say maybe I had a personal affinity to that individual. There wasn't an intimate relationship or friendship. In some ways that they might have delivered some tough news you know about an area where i was weak or less formed and you'd be open at that moment no matter how much it, it kind of rankles or hurts and just say okay this person actually cared enough to give me this feedback i'm going to ask them well what would you do in my position how would you get that knowledge so a case in point i worked with an hr leader um, who was tremendous. She had been uh, head of global HR at Sheraton Corporation, you know, and managed on a scale far beyond even what we were doing at Lionbridge. And she identified that as an extroverted kind of public facing sales leader, if I were going to go into an operational role as I did as general manager, I really needed to work on the whole group, you know, feedback and collaboration part of it, because if not, I was going to drive people crazy. And so she arranged as a mentor to send me to a Center for Creative Leadership in Colorado and participate in a grueling executive session that went on over a week, um, which broke down feedback. And you received feedback that had been gathered over three or four months from your colleagues, your bosses, even board members employees and clients. And then you also practiced, most importantly, you practice how to give feedback as well as how to receive it. So I think mentorship is about receiving feedback, right? It's about giving and getting feedback. So start there, be open to it, identify your weaknesses, and then don't be bashful. Ask someone that you respect or admire, even if you don't have a strong personal relationship with them, ask them how, how would they go about great, helping you? Great advice. Yeah. Thank you. I should probably take, take some of that advice myself. <laughs> I don't think so, Allison. I, I work with Allison all the time. I have to tell you, I mean, you represent everything that's right. <laughs> about, about women. Um, okay, great. So what we'd love to do now, um, I'll pause there. I'd love to have people jump in and ask questions to Paula or share your experiences as well. Um, I mean, we've covered a number of topics already spanning from developing a career to financial acumen um, to the localization industry itself. So um, anyone who has a question, go ahead and uh, request to share your audio and video and we'd love to have bring you up for the discussion. Um, and while we're waiting for that, um, I know in particular, Paula, that uh, a discussion that you were interested to have with the group was, um, this premise of how COVID has changed or, or the pandemic has changed people's lives. Um, so we'd be really interested to hear, yeah. you know, um, first of all, have you changed physical locations? Has, has the pandemic led to sort of a shift in, in where you're located? Um, but then also sort of in, you know, in line with this theme of um, orienting the conversation around, around careers, um, how has it impacted your, your, your work life? So has, has it blurred the line between work and home? Um, has it stayed the same? And then uh, most interestingly, do you feel that you are ahead of your career as a result of the pandemic at the same point or behind in your career? And so we'd love to take uh, some questions or discussion now. Okay, 
but we'll wait for that. Uh, I guess, Paula, I know you had mentioned yesterday that um, you you had some theories around how you think this has impacted women in the work. Oh, we have one question. Hold on. Great. Yeah, I see that there are questions. It probably just takes us a sec to get people spooled It up. does. So we have Melissa moderating. Can I think you use her? Hi, Anne. Hi. Can you guys hear me okay? okay. Yeah, this is great. Hi, Hi thanks Anne. for having me. And everyone, if you want, you can double click on Anne's window because you're <laughs> sick of me by now. So uh, feel free to double click so you can really see Anne. And thanks for being brave. Yeah, like no the worries, first one no on worries. stage happy, is never easy. So. so ask a question. Um, so I'm really new to localization as a field. Um, my background is actually in linguistics as well. Um, I came from the kind of academic side of linguistics. I remember early on in my career, I was um, kind of steered away from doing translations and, and was really kind of encouraged to stay in academia. So I did, I was, you know, 22 and uh, went for a PhD in linguistics. But at the end of that, I kind of realized that I wasn't really super interested in pursuing an academic career and then ended up getting into marketing. So now I've been in marketing for the past 10 years and now I find myself in this position in a company where I'm essentially doing localization as a big part of my job. And so I'm kind of interested um, in y'all's experiences with linguistics as a field of study and kind of what are the, the biases? Like I'm just kind of shocked that the whole time that I was studying linguistics, nobody mentioned that this was like a career path that you could actually get into the business world and have an impact and yeah and bring your linguistic expertise to the table in a way that is really powerful and, and kind of makes a difference with, with end users, consumers, et cetera. Oh, this is just like such a great question. And first of all, what an amazing background you have. And uh, I think it's kind of brave to go from a PhD in linguistics <laughs> into marketing. So I'd love to learn more about that. But it's funny because Allison and I were speaking yesterday and I, I had mentioned, you know, I, I dove into languages with the minor in linguistics, but at, at the time I also did computer science. And in the summer I worked as a publishing artist at a newspaper, which was like, you know, layout, mm -hmm. not no, you know, no uh, Adobe products. Then it was, it was by hand, you know, with Ruby Lith and Pista. And none of these three things went together at all, right? So my work in linguistics at McGill was incredibly academic. Um, and, you know, fascinating, but very academic. And the work with um, publishing was just to, to pay, you know, pay some tuition bills. And then year, years go by and these things come together. Mm -hmm. And so you can't ever predict how that's going to happen. So based on what you just said with your background and your, your experience, I think this could be one of the most fascinating times. Because to be honest, even at the larger companies, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there would be... Um, computational mm -hmm. linguists and there were some token people doing research working on technology solutions then there were companies that were actual technology publishers you know creating platforms translation technology mm -hmm. tools machine translation and they employed people with computational linguistic backgrounds but i think today with the focus on neural mm -hmm. networks and ai and machine learning there's there's just a much clearer path for the expertise that you have. And so what I look at specifically, I've been fascinated over the last few months as we quarantined together here in the, in the spring, um, my eldest son's girlfriend quarantined with us and she's working as a solution architect at one of the world's leading chat bots. And I, I would hear her, you know, engaging with clients that they had around the world. And it was unbelievable that language and the localization of these chatbots was mm -hmm. core to the growth of this hot startup that had nothing to do with localization. And in fact, their own engineers were stumbling and making every mistake mm -hmm. that you can that you can think of, right? So if I look back and I think about um, horrible projects I worked on were some early voice assistant projects for companies who will remain nameless where they didn't have the expertise uh -huh. in linguistics to actually structure the project for their developers the way that they should. There's a huge focus today, I think almost erroneously in the localization industry on 
the task aspect of um, machine learning and AI. What I mean is more the, the aggregation of data, the annotation of data, the kind of enrichment through task and, and management of crowds of data. Very important. I don't mean to denigrate that. But as we see with new neural networks, they're requiring less and less pre-training and more and more intelligence. And so I, I would think working for one of the core technology companies that's mm -hmm. doing R&D, you know, like a lilt, um, when I look at the team that we have in Berlin, I mean, they're just so smart. I, I wish I were younger, I could start over. And then the other thing is to look in an ancillary or an adjacent industry like mm -hmm. support where they're using chatbots and voice assistants. Mm -hmm. And you, now you know language and you've got the linguistics background. It's really I think interesting. Thanks for your insight. It's really interesting. Thanks for your insight. I'll leave now. <laughs> Thanks for being brave and jumping in. Where I'm in California and uh, where, I work for you Tia Smart and uh, we're a very global company. Um, so we're just kind of entering into kind of how to how to make everything sound native in in the different markets <laughs> that's great yeah because when you say like if you're doing localization you know they always like oh right. who, who majored in french like who's got Leo's language but if you can make a difference mm -hmm. in a product you know and make a, an offering enabled and globalized i think that's a lot of fun well, that, thanks, that's very thanks, challenging ladies. great thank you um, well, Paul, I have another question for you as well, but I, I mean, from the audience, I guess I'll say I would love to hear from anybody in, in regards to sort of fast forward to current day and how the global pandemic has impacted you in the world. Um, I, Paul and I have had a discussion and I'll share a few documents and, or a few articles in a minute in the chat, but um, virtually every large newspaper out there has written articles about how the pandemic is um, hindering the ability of women to succeed in the work across a, a variety of, of channels. Um, so Paula, I know you had a few theories about ways that it has been positive and ways that it has been negative, and I'd love to hear about those. And then for anyone else out there listening, I would also love to hear um, how you have found yourself impacted by what is clearly a very shifting dynamic in the workplace. Um, regardless of your geographic location, I would imagine there are some unless you're in New Zealand and then maybe you're in New Zealand. Yeah, and I mean, I, when we were talking about this, you know, just throwing this out for the group and I really would love to hear what you're experiencing. So I, I could see this two ways. One thing that I am thrilled about, um, and it's obviously based on my own personal experience is that I see a new world now where we are no longer covering up the fact that we actually have private lives, right? And as a woman in business, kind of rising up through the 80s and the 90s and having children at the same time, um, the, the thing I regret the most is that, you know, there was a lack of, in a sense, honesty, certainly in the corporate world. Um, the fact that you were, you know, juggling, I had three boys, I mean, and, and just an incredible husband helping, but still, like we all know, you know, it's horrible juggle when they're young. And all of that had to be kept private in a sense. Now, was that my own belief or was that society uh, not rewarding me if I had to stay home because someone had a fever? Um, I do remember being really kind of a bit ticked off, you know, that guys at the office place who were saying, oh, you know, it's three o'clock and I've got to go because I'm the coach of, you know, the, the hockey team. And everyone would be like, oh, what a great guy. Like, he's just the best. Eh? Like, he's, he's coaching his son's hockey team. You know, he's there twice a week and on the weekends. And I'm thinking, oh, hello. You know, I mean, I'd love to do that. But every time I, I say I have to leave the office for kids, you know, I feel like I get a check mark against my name. So that's one thing is that I'd love love to know if you feel that it's just during COVID, it's impossible to have this facade of perfection. So that's my assertion. And then on the other hand, I worry. I worry a little bit. Um, and I think, Allison, you found in the articles that they confirm that maybe during COVID from a career perspective, women are not advancing. And my theory for that is that, you know, we're often focused on really executing the tactics, the action items, making sure that we're perfect and we fulfill and we do and we do all of this stuff. And so during COVID working remotely, we can be heads down, you know, doing tasks. But I, I worry, are we participating in the strategy discussions the mm -hmm. way we might have, mm -hmm. you know, in public face-to-face -face meetings? So just throw that out there. That's personal, that's my own bias, but those are kind of the two yeah. ends of the Yeah, that's that exactly I, I what I was about. reading about. Um, these these two elements in particular that seem to become themes across the articles 
The first is that, especially when there's childcare involved, women are always assumed to be the caretaker. Um, you know, in, in a house where, where the children are at home, the woman is automatically the one who is sort of assumed, as you mentioned, that she will be taking care of the children. Uh, and then the other is this element of networking, where um, it, you know, people intuitively tend to seek out others like themselves. And so when you're in a situation where you're all remote, it becomes that much more challenging for a, a woman to engage in that same type of networking. And, and as a result, you know, ultimately be involved or not be involved in those strategy discussions. Um, so it's, it's definitely very interesting. Well, I see. Thanks for sharing the articles. That's really great. So you've got a, a Wall Street Journal article, a New York Times, and a Harvard Business Review. So that's some, some excellent input. But I'd love to hear, we have yeah. probably only a couple minutes left. It's flown by. Um, but I'd love to hear from anybody who, who wants to jump on stage. And any question, as Allison promised, I mean, I, I, I imagine there would be questions that are off limits. I mean, let's be honest, but I'm going to say yeah. nothing's off limits, you know, within reason. So, Well, while we're waiting, oh, oh we have a perfect, what, and that in? <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Much appreciated. <laughs> I saw Annette just a second ago. Um, well, while we're waiting for that to, okay. to sync up properly, um, one last question that I had for you, I would be interested to hear, um, for those of us who are earlier on in our career, is there something that you wish you had known earlier or advice that you would give um, to people? And, I, and I'm sure there's a lot, but sort of, you know, the one or two <laughs> things that it's like, wow, I, I wish I had really known. Well, given that we're in a, a breakout, you know, women in localization and the focus on kind of, you know, um, our careers, um, I think it took me a while to get to that point where, you know, is it is it because we're socially conditioned to, you know, smooth things over or to want to be bridges or to make people comfortable? Um, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's that notion, real or imagined, that, um, you're not as maybe uh, thick skinned as you could be. All right. So I'm not talking about this nonsense of, you know, uh, women are emotional and this and this and this. Forget that. I actually don't believe that. But I do believe that there is something around being thick skinned where, you know, something might happen or I'd be I'd be kind of brushed back in a, in a meeting and think, well, you know, that, that was kind of rude or, you know, what's wrong? Like thinking it's personal. So my advice or Allison, what I used to get to was, I, I can't remember who it was who first said this to me, but would be say, well, what would it, what would the guys do? And I came to the realization over time and time again, they wouldn't even notice, you know, so I would always ask myself afterwards, like if I were smarting, you know, from an interaction or I felt that something hadn't gone well or it was kind of abrupt and I'd say, well, what would the guys do? And just say, no, they wouldn't even care. Like they'd show up the next day. This never even happened. It's water on the, under the bridge. So, you know, we can be very proud of, of working together and networking, but at the same time, like, you know, it's, it's not personal. Like a lot of this stuff in business, it's just not personal. So just move on, you know, and, and it's not a bad idea to learn sometimes from the guys and say, what would the guys do? The guys wouldn't even notice. Hi so there. just Hi move Paula. on. Hi, Allison. Good morning. Annette, Good morning. Hello. Hello. Um, I was just curious about something you said a moment ago. Um, Paula, you mentioned, you know, you worry about how uh, women are maybe not participating in the strategy questions uh, or st strategy discussions quite as often uh, due to COVID and due to these, you know, crazy times that we live in. So more in, in a opportunity to pick your brain, how would you propose that, you know, we, we change that path or how do you, you know, some simple tactics to, to get women still exp in those conversations, even in, in a remote environment that we live in? Yeah, and that thanks. And you know, the devil is always in the details. Like, what what do I actually mean by this? So I guess on a very actionable small level, 
if our tendency is to jump in and to be superstars, so, uh, all right, this thing needs to be done or some work product needs to be delivered, an article needs to be written or files need to be validated, you know, by X and such time this week, our in initial feeling might be like, let's get on it. Like, let's do a really good job. Let's get in there. Let's deliver it on time. It's very kind of task focused. My, what I'm saying is sometimes maybe stop and back up. First of all, make sure that you understand how this aligns with the company's goals. At the minimum, how does it align with your manager's goals and what you guys are trying to accomplish as a group? And if you're not clear uh, that something does align, you're probably not wrong, you know, because you've got experience and you, you are a valuable team member. And so I think questioning appropriately how things fit in strategically is an excellent way to start having people think of you as a more strategic thinker on the team. So it doesn't have to be some massive show of faux bravado, you know, like I, I'd like to look at our go-to-market plan as a company. No, just, just, you know, in the area that you touch and influence, make sure that you feel that what you're doing is uh, aligned with the goals of the team or the company, that it's set up in a way that everyone can succeed. And, and then, of course, there's plenty of time to dive in and execute on a task-based level. So, and then I hope that's, I mean, I try, I'm trying to make it more small and actionable so it doesn't sound like blah, blah, but that's what I would do is just slow down and question as opposed to jumping off of a Zoom call and say, well, I'll, I'll follow up great. and I'll at get this, that done by Wednesday you know, morning. In my perspective at this we can talk about all of the issues in the world and, and it's particularly how, how it's impacting women, but then it's, you know, very few people actually talk about, okay, well, how do we course correct this? Um, and we just start dwelling on the problem and it's like, okay, we see the problem, but I loved the tactics. I love the suggestions. I think that you're perfectly spot on and I'm going to try to weave that into my day to day. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Ladies, I have to wrap this up. This was a fantastic discussion. We've got to get Paula to the main stage. Uh, so please come join us in a few minutes there. But in the meantime, Paula, thank you so much. This was a really great way to start the day. Uh, and thank you for all the advice. I think we should do this again. I, I love this idea of doing a coffee conversation. And um, without committing us or you, Allison, okay. let's, let's brainstorm because this would be just fantastic to uh, to keep going. Now, obviously, we'll do that in the framework of women and localization, you know, because we're super committed now with the announcement of our, our role and our sponsorship level. Um, so maybe yeah. we do it together. With this was great. Women and this was great. I Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.